Welcome to the St. Petersburg Psy Cafe series. My name is Howard Rutherford. I am the Director of Development for the University of South Florida College of Marine Science. Uh, we, I am part of the team that, that helps coordinate the Psy Cafe series here in partnership with the Dali Museum, uh, our host. Uh, also, Secrets of the Sea Marine Exploration Center and Aquarium. And our sponsors include Hearn Hoyt Ramsey Group at the Raymond James. So we thank you for your support and for joining us this evening. Um, in addition, this is a very special Sci Cafe because this is part of the USF College of Marine Sciences Eminent Lecture Scholar Series. Uh, so once a year, we invite the preeminent um, scholars in their respective fields to the college uh, for, uh, for lecturers with our academic community. Um, and I suggested that we share these people with our community. So what better place to share them than here at the St. Petersburg Psy Cafe? So we thank Francisco Chavez, Dr. Chavez, Senor Chavez, from uh, the Monterey Bay Research Institute in, in Monterey Bay, uh, California, for stepping up uh, to be on our panel tonight. Uh, in addition, we have uh, Mark Luther, uh, a faculty member from USF College of Marine Science on our panel. And I know those who normally come to the Psy Cafe, our Psy Cafes are moderated by Rob Lorai, the news director over at WMNF. But tonight we have a special guest, and that's Frank Muller Carter, who is also, oh, clap, clap, clap for Frank. <laughs> so Frank has agreed to moderate our discussion tonight. This is not a lecture. Um, uh, so if you haven't been to a Psy Cafe before, it's short and sweet. Have a drink and think. Um, so uh, there are no barriers here. Uh, we want this to be a, a conversation. So if you have a question uh, while the panel uh, is, is, uh, having, is, is sharing their information, please, please feel free to ask a question at any time. Um, speaking of drinks, normally the cafe ends at 6.45, but tonight it's gonna close at eight o'clock. So if you want to refresh your beverage, please feel free to go and, and refresh your beverage outside. We have some flatbreads here. If, you get a, um, if you're hungry, we'd love to um, enjoy the flatbreads from the Cafe Gala. But I also like to recognize our other preeminent lecture scholars who are joining us tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Ellen Thomas. Dr. Thomas? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Thomas is from Yale University. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Bill Johns from uh, University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences in the back. And we have Curtis uh, Deutsch, excuse me, Dr. Curtis Deutsch from the School of Oceanography at the University of Washington also joining us. Curtis, that's Curtis. Oh. So um, usually we're not this, this well prepared, but I want to give you a teaser for the next Psy Cafe, which is going to be May 17th. Um, and uh, it's, I don't choose the titles, I just read them here. Uh, <laughs> Swinging Ain't Just for Monkeys, Monogamy and Polygamy in the Animal Kingdom. And uh, we actually have, hi Chris, we actually, <laughs> We actually have one of the panelists joining us today, Dr. Debbie Castle, in the back from USF St. Pete. So uh, she'll be able to share with us um, about our next Psy Cafe. So as you can imagine, it's a very casual conversation. So uh, take it away, Frank, and thank you for joining us this evening. Well, thank you, Howard. I'm not going to speak very much. I'm going to let the panel in, uh, introduce themselves. And so I think that Mark is going to go first. Oh, OK. <laughs> well. So how do I advance the slides? Do I go over here? Well, I'm Mark Luther. Um, I'm a physical oceanographer, which means I study the motion of the ocean, winds and waves and currents and tides, and all the things that, that those affect. But our topic tonight is extreme events. And the sort of extreme events that I work on are coastal flooding events, coastal storms, particularly how they impact uh, maritime transportation, ports and harbors. Uh, we do a lot of work on basic maritime security, but security means lots more than just protecting against bad guys in boats with bombs. Uh, 
Hurricane Sandy, for instance, in the port of New York and New Jersey, did much more damage than any terrorist attack could have ever hoped to do. Um, the storm made a direct hit on the port of New York and New Jersey. Aside from doing lots of damage in the surrounding populace, it shut down the port of New York and New Jersey for seven or eight days completely, which had huge repercussions throughout the U.S. economy. Um, it hit just before Black Friday, so it totally interrupted the supply chain for all the Walmarts and the Best Buys and all of that, cost many billions of dollars. Uh, and even once they got the port back open again, a lot of the maritime terminals there, the terminals that unload the ships of containers or fuel oil or gasoline and things like that, their infrastructure was severely damaged and it took weeks and months for many of those terminals to get back open again. So again, when you're thinking about port security and extreme events, these sorts of things are of particular concern. Uh, NOAA happened to have a tide gauge in the upper left there, right at uh, the battery at Lower Manhattan, and a weather buoy uh, just offshore of the entrance to the harbor. And the graphics here in the lower left is showing the water level. The red curve is the observed tide height. The blue is the predicted tides from the normal tide tables. The green is the difference between the two. Well, this is 14 feet at the top. So the water level got up to 14 feet above a normal low tide level, which inundated much of Manhattan, flooded subway tunnels, flooded underground electrical uh, substations and things like that, wiped out power to, to major parts of the city. The graphic in the upper right there is the significant wave height, the average height of the highest waves. Waves got up to almost 35 feet on average. Many waves were much higher than that during the storm. The lower graphic there is the wind speed. The winds got up to almost 50 knots. And so that caused severe damage, uh, destroying all sorts of infrastructure and uh, <laughs> embarrassing the Statue of Liberty. And I don't mean to make light of mass destruction, but it was such a funny picture, I just had to show it. The point is, though, that these things are not uncommon. Uh, they happen frequently. And we spend a lot of money and effort protecting against terrorist attack. Terrorist attacks have never successfully attacked a port in the US. Ports in the US are the lifeblood of our economy. 90% of all commerce, international commerce for the US goes by maritime transportation. Events like this are becoming more severe and more common, and the prediction is that with global climate change, that they're gonna to continue to become more severe and more frequent. Uh, data that we've been analyzing from tide gauges and weather stations around the US show that over the last 15 to 20 years, the incidence of coastal flooding from the combined events of storm surge, the storm winds just blowing water up against the coastline, combined with intense rainfall events causing coastal flooding, coastal inundation has increased considerably for most major cities, most major coastal cities in the US. Latest estimate is something like 40% of the US population lives on the coast. Most of those people are clustered around what we call urbanized estuaries, places like Tampa Bay, New York Harbor, LA Long Beach, San Francisco Bay. They're clustered around these urbanized estuaries because there's a port there. The reason those cities grew in those places in the first place is because there was a port there and there was easy maritime transportation or transport of goods by ship in and out. So that's what I do for a living is try to work with uh, ports and harbors and the people who work in there to help them make better decisions based on the best scientific data of what the storm threat is to their, their ports and all that maritime transportation infrastructure. Thank you, Mark.
Francisco. Yes. So while they prepare, the way that this should work tonight is that you need to ask the questions. And I will only fill in the time if everybody falls asleep. So uh, please be very active and interact with the speakers. This is not like the presidential debate, so everything should be clean and, you know. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Francisco Chavez. I'm a uh, biological oceanographer from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Uh, and Bari is uh, of the family, uh, have any of you been in Monterey here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Been, been, been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, the Packard family, uh, David Packard from Hewlett Packard and his daughters uh, founded the aquarium in 1983 and the aquarium was such a success that uh, after a couple of years, the little gift shop was making a million dollars a year. Uh, and uh, they went back to their father and said, Dad, we think we should invest in, uh, that money in research. And their dad said, no, you keep that money to the aquarium. I'm going to start a new institute. And I was fortunate enough that the first director of that institute almost 30 years ago was my PhD advisor. And so we uh, uh, packed up from North Carolina, Duke, and... Uh, came over to Monterey, and I'm, I'm still there. It's a wonderful place to work. Uh, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about El Nino, which most of you know. Maybe some of you don't know about El Viejo, the old man. El Nino is the child. Uh, extreme events of, of global climate variability. And, you know, uh, every day, well, maybe a few months ago, there was things in the news. El Nino is coming, uh, death and destruction, uh, it, 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 it's kind of uh, ironic that if you're from California, uh, nowadays people are going, come on El Nino, please. <laughs> uh, because we're in the uh, 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 worst drought, one of the worst droughts in, on record, and uh, uh, we get a lot of, uh, uh, of rain there. But El Nino basically change, changes climate everywhere. Uh, and I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time just telling you what El Nino is, and then, uh, then we can have a little discussion. Uh, El Nino is basically a warming of the uh, equatorial Pacific from the coast of Peru, where the name was born, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, to about the dateline. And, and this is, that's the general pattern. So uh, the reds are places where the ocean is, is uh, uh, on average warmer. The blues would be places where on average is cooler, so the whole world doesn't get warmer to El Nino, but, uh, but certain parts do. And uh, on the top is sort of the history of El Nino. El Nino comes every three to eight years, lasts for about six to 18 months. So there was an El Nino in 1925, 1941, 57, 72, 82, 97, and then one recently in 2015. Uh, and I guess I, I can say that El Nino sort of followed me around. I, uh, I was born uh, in a little town up in northern Peru called Talara. My uh, uh, father had a clinic there. He took care of uh, uh, people from Standard Oil. Standard Oil had a little piece of America there. Uh, he was Peruvian, and my, my mother was uh, from the US. Anyway, my mother uh, uh, told me that in 57, uh, Talara is, sits on a, 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 a below a big uh, bluff. And then there's, it, it's no, normally a dry uh, creek bed. But in 57, 58, there was so much rain there that there was water up to our knees. Of course, I was only four years old, and so I don't, I don't remember. Uh, in 1972, actually 1970, I uh, 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 came from Peru to uh, California to go to school at Humboldt State. And a couple years uh, later, I drove back uh, uh, to Peru with a couple of uh, colleagues, friends, and I was almost uh, uh, killed in Ecuador by a landslide caused by the 1972-73 El Nino. <laughs> we, we were, uh, uh, there had been a big rock slide, and they had carved a way through the uh, rubble. And we were, you, you, you couldn't go very fast. We had a, a, one of the first uh, SUVs, an international travel all. I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember a travel all. But anyway, we're, we're trying to make our way. We're almost all the way out, and we hear this rumble. 
And there's boulders probably the size of this uh, uh, room coming down behind us. And you know, we're jumping on the driver, hurry up, hurry up. Of course, he couldn't. And we fortunately made our way out and uh, uh, survived that. Uh, I returned to Peru in 82 to uh, work on a PhD dissertation. And uh, uh, a few months after I started that, the biggest El Nino of the century hit. So I, I came to California, uh, and about eight, eight years later, we had the 97, 98 El Nino. So I can't get away from, uh, of course, nobody can. We're all, we're all uh, 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 impacted by this uh, event that has global consequences. I'm going to see if I can play this uh, a video, or if it plays. OK. Uh, the colors on the screen are as pretty, uh, but you the, somewhere here there should be a counter on time. Okay, on the top, uh, and and you'll see the eighty two eighty three event actually went through. the The ocean will get colder and warmer along the equator and along the coast of California, as we watch this uh, animation. Uh, so, I guess the the the, the what I want to get across from this is. The ocean is a lot more dynamic than we think it is. We look at the ocean uh, from afar and we think it's this you know, evenly distributed uh, 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 water mass, but it, it's exactly the opposite. On every year, uh, conditions are different. There are places where it's warmer. There's places where it's colder. This is 92, 93. You'll watch when we get to 97 and we'll get another big El Nino signature right here in the, uh, along the equator. Here's this little cold event. We're about ready to get into the 97, 98 El Nino. There it comes, see? Maybe I should speed, if I could speed this up. Well, I'll, let's just let it run, it's kind of a... Hypnotizing. Yeah. Ask questions, maybe. Questions from, this, from the audience? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you that in the next slide. <laughs> uh, it, it, essentially, what happens is the, 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 it, during uh, uh, some periods, the trade winds, which blow along this way, pile up a whole bunch of water and heat over here. And that uh, a potential energy is released occasionally. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, on average, sea level, sea level here is about 40 centimeters higher than it is here. And that's a lot of water. And, and all of a sudden, that water gets released, and it, and it comes back. Uh, uh, and it comes back in, in a little bit of a complicated wave, partly by waves that propagate across the Pacific uh, uh, at about 200 kilometers a day. And, and that changes uh, the currents, which then bring the warm water that normally sits over here over to the, uh, uh, over westward. So why is three degrees variation so important? Uh, because the, uh, uh, for example, the, the atmosphere is very, uh, doesn't have, doesn't retain a lot of heat. But if you move, if you, you know, you take something this large, this is, it ends in December 2015, th that is an incredible amount of heat. And that moves all of the pressure systems around the world to different positions. And when you do that, you alter weather everywhere. And remember, that's one third the circumference of the globe. And if you look, Tampa, Florida is actually west of Lima, Peru. So all of that heat sitting directly to the south of the continental US and it disrupts weather patterns over the entire globe, but particularly over the southeastern U.S. Thank you. There's a, a, there's a little other little uh, caricature. I may have too many things here. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the name was actually coined by northern Peru fishermen just south of where I was born in a little town called Paita. Because every, uh, every so often in the summer or in, around Christmas time, this warm current showed up. And so they called it El Nino, capital E, capital N, for the Christ child. Uh, and in, in the unusual years, there was an incredible amount of rainfall there. Uh, uh, it's, there's usually millimeters of rain, and it goes into uh, several centimeters uh, uh, um, a day at, at times. 
and, and all of a sudden things, different, very th different things to show up off, off of that uh, part of the world. Crocodiles that you normally are living in the Rio Guayas make their way down south. <coughs> About 20 or, or 30 years later, a, a British meteorologist by the name of Sir Gerblet Walker coined a term that's called the Southern Oscillation. And in the uh, technical parlance of science, we, we, we refer to the El Nino phenomena as El Nino Southern Oscillation. Because it, there's a link between what's, what's happening in the atmosphere and what's happening in the ocean. Southern Oscillation, the atmosphere, El Nino, the ocean. And it, it really isn't, you know, it's a pre pretty amazing it took us this long. It isn't until late 60s that a, 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 uh, a Swedish meteorologist by the name of Björkness puts them together. And then we, we start to understand why uh, uh, this phenomena uh, that uh, you know, was first coined by a few fishermen here, it really changes weather almost everywhere. And Mark was talking about how uh, this part of the world, in fact, the, uh, the, the rainfall events that were happening in Louisiana uh, a few weeks ago even, uh, were very much likely associated with uh, the El Nino phenomena. Well, and please add, add, let, ask, let's, let's make this a little interactive, uh, ask questions as we're going on. Yes? Is, you know, over the years, is El, El Nino getting worse due to uh, climate uh, change effects? That, that's an excellent question, and unfortunately one we don't have a definitive answer on. Uh, the 82-83 the, the, the El Nino was coined the El Nino of the century. And then 20 years later, there was another El Nino of the century. And so we started to wonder if that was happening. Uh, at, at the same time, there's so much natural variability that it's very difficult for us to say, yes, you know, we, we have something to do with that. Yes. Is there anything in the Atlantic Ocean that's equivalent? I see nothing uh, affecting Europe at all, and the Atlantic Ocean doesn't seem to have any. Uh, my uh, PhD advisor used to call the Atlantic a nervous little ocean because, uh, <laughs> because you need a lot of mass to get something big ha to happen, and the Pacific is just much bigger. Having said that, there are uh, some things. There is a, an Atlantic El Nino. It's ne not as big as the, as the Pacific one. There are other uh, phenomena that are varying on longer time scales, something called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. There's also something called the North Atlantic Oscillation. So there are things like it, but El Nino is just the biggest thing. It's the biggest thing uh, in terms of uh, uh, present day climate variability. It just overwhelms everything else. But it doesn't mean there's nothing else going on. Yes? How, do, um, climate, how does climate change and El Nino how do they interact? Yeah, interact? I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> it's, we, we, we don't know. And in fact, the, this last couple of years, 2014 through 15, 16, were very odd in the Pacific. And everybody was asking that same question. Is it because something we've done? Is this a sign of a change? Because uh, if I get to it, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about these longer term cycles that we call regime shifts, and where uh, rather than being every six to 18 months or happening every three to eight years, they stay around for 20 to 50 years. Not, not as strong, but there, there's these periods when things are either lower or higher in temperature in certain parts of the world. And, and does that, and, and, and so maybe that is, those are interacting and. What about sea level rises? Uh, sea level rise, probably does not have uh, much to do with El Nino per se, but El, Ni El Nino changes sea level pretty dramatically. Because as I said, you know, normally it's 40 centimeters higher here, and during El Nino, uh, sea level off Peru will go up uh, 30 to 40 centimeters, which is much greater than the, than the gradual rise in sea level that we're seeing. So is the release of the warm waters from the west to the east a result of the trade winds not being as strong? Uh, the, there is a, there's a general weakening, but the first thing that kicks them off is, are these, uh, the, the, the southern oscillation is basically the difference in pressure from this a, a high pressure system that sits here, the south, eastern tropical high, and the, Indi, uh, the Indonesian low. 
And you measure it by the difference between uh, sea level pressure in Tahiti and Darwin, Australia. And as this low uh, somehow moves in, inwards a little bit, you start to generate these wave, these Kelvin waves. That begins a series of things that keep pushing into the uh, 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 center of the Pacific, weakening the trade winds. So there is a weakening, a general weakening of the trade winds. It's not sure what's the chicken or the egg. The atmosphere and the ocean are playing this game, and uh, we don't know what, what kicks off what very well. Yes? Is there any correlation between outer space, for instance, planets, uh, comets, there, there's, um, that would affect what's happening here? There could be, although there is no, uh, there's also talk, thoughts that, they, that volcanism might have something to do with it. Um, but uh, we, don't, we, we don't think so. But it doesn't mean that that's not true. Uh, there, there's enough that we understand that this, this play of, of uh, uh, warm water piling up and going back seems to be a natural thing that occurs in the system. But, but uh, there are people that write about volcanic eruptions causing it and uh, things we don't think so. Yes? I noticed when you showed the chart where the trade winds were blowing the water that way. Let's, let's put this one up. Okay. It didn't seem, the intensity it shows on the map of the heat didn't seem comparable to the intensity it shows when it gets over in the El Nino. Is there something else causing that to heat up? Uh, or is it just the way the map was? Yeah, I think it's just the way the map was. I didn't really have the trade winds there. Those, that was mainly temperature. So. I've, I've sort of talked through this. Here's this high, low pressure system that sits over Indonesia, and then there's a high pressure over here, causing this trade wind ac action to accumulate this heat and water over here. And, and that actually piles up and deepens what we call the thermocline. The thermocline, the ocean is, is, is divided in two layers, a warm layer and a, and a deeper, colder layer. And for biological purposes, that deeper, colder layer is important because it's kind of like a compost. As material sinks down there, it decomposes. But it's, it's down below the, where light reaches, and so it doesn't do anything. So it's just like if you, if you gave a lot of fertilizer to your plants and then cover them with a black tarp, it wouldn't do anything. But there are processes that bring that water back up to the surface, upwelling, which happens along the equator and happens along the coast of Peru, it bring that fertilizer to the surface and uh, things grow. In Monterey, we have upwelling. In the coast of Peru, we have upwelling. And we get this very rich sea life. Uh, what happens during El Nino, as this uh, Indonesian low moves into the Central Pacific, you generate these waves. And these waves propagate across. And, and it takes about two months for a wave that's generated here to reach the coast of Peru. And what, it, what they do is they deepen this thermocline. And that changes the whole circulation pattern of the ocean. And it essentially ends up warming up this entire region. Does that help a little bit? Uh, and then that is maintained for about 6 to 18 months. And then the trade winds uh, uh, start to get strong again. And we get back up. And we get cold water. And we get happy fish in Peru and things of that nature. <laughs> And does the trade, the trade winds still blow this direction, or do they reverse? Uh, they, o they only reverse, o they, yeah, they reverse back here. Yes, they do reverse. And so they, these are, there's these, they, we call them westerly wind bursts over here. And, and as the, it, it's kind of little, they, they sort of go in steps. The first one moves over the, the low over a little bit, and then it keeps moving it, keeps moving it. And the bigger the El Nino, the farther it goes okay. into, the, uh, into the Pacific. Okay, well, that was, uh, this is the, the, the map where I was, I, I already told you, I was born up here. <laughs> uh, and then I, I went back to uh, uh, start my uh, uh, PhD research right here. And, and this is what, what I measured with some very sophisticated uh, instruments. Uh, uh, we we uh, rented a, uh, a fishing boat, and we had a little winch and we would manually uh, lower a, a set of bottles down, and we'd bring them back up, and we'd measure things from the bottles. And, and, uh, uh, and what we measured, 
So I, I started, and I was going to study. I wasn't going to study El Nino. I was going to study, you know, the, the normal upwelling. And in June, and all of a sudden, in, on September 22nd, on a particular day, the temperature there increased by four degrees centigrade, and then it continued to increase. This is the this is the average temperature at that area. This is an area that's five degrees from the equator, so it's very close. To, it's tropical. Should be tropical. Yet the average temperatures are uh, probably quite a bit lower than, than uh, they are here in St. Petersburg most of the time. Uh, it, it reaches a peak in the summer. And here in May of, of uh, 1983, the temperatures in, in that part of the world were 10 degrees warmer than average, 60, 16 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than average. If, if it was 16 degrees warmer than average here in St. Petersburg, uh, I think there would be I don't know if there'd be, people would be happy or not, but uh, <laughs> <coughs> and, and this is what, uh, 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 when I, uh, uh, I first got there to start, there's, a, there's a, 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 a road that goes from the airport in Puda, which is inland, to the uh, port, and I would take it and I would go and uh, I trained uh, uh, some of my Peruvian friends to do, the, do some of the work there, and then I come back, and when I came back, uh, I got, I got to tell you another uh, interesting anecdote. So when, uh, once we knew, we sort of knew that this was coming on, and uh, we met uh, some U.S. scientists that were, had come to Lima in, on a vessel. They'd come across the Pacific. And we went on the boat with them, and they said, we've, we've seen changes in the ocean we've never seen before. Uh, the thermocline is, you know, deeper than we've ever seen it on the equator. So I went back to my family. I, I had, my father was the oldest of 10, and so I, some of my aunts and uncles, and I said, you know what? It's going to be disastrous this summer. There's going to be rain everywhere. They laughed at me, you know, and said, okay, whatever. You know, I was uh, 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 a young kid. So I came back in January, and I came up here, and it was like this, and then they said, how did you know? <laughs> So I gained some respect uh, uh, with the family. I mean, there's t tremendous disasters in northern Peru during this. The roads get completely washed out. I had to take one, uh, uh, it's like a, it's not a taxi, we call them colectivos. You get, you get, so you get five people on a, on a, a car and you go uh, from one side of the place to the other. And I had to take one and there, there, there was a new river and so we would get down, they get us across the river, we get on to their next one. and. I got to the town and it's totally washed out. Uh, there, there's, there's pretty amazing uh, uh, consequences. This happens to be in the Galapagos Islands. This is during a cold year. You can see how dry it is, and this was in the warm year. Uh, this was my PhD advisor at Duke. Uh, and uh, you know, the whole ocean changes in terms of uh, 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 what lives there. The normal uh, uh, ocean off Peru is uh, dominated by, primarily by this, uh, by the anchovy. It's the biggest single species fishery in the world. At some time, uh, it accounted for 20% of the total global catch o over an area that's less than 0.1% uh, by area. So 20% of the global catch over a very small area. There's other uh, uh, fish that are typically there. The uh, uh, cormorant is a big uh, player. And when, when this uh, water that's normally cool becomes very warm, it opens it up for all these tropical species to show up. And uh, uh, the sardine is favored during warmer years, but we get a lot of mahi-mahi, uh, uh, swordfish, uh, tuna, uh, the uh, uh, shrimp that's normally up off of Ecuador becomes uh, uh, predominant uh, here. How are we doing? Should, should, I, should we stop and, and I was uh, pr briefly introduce El Viejo or should we keep asking questions or how, uh, what, 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 does the, uh, what does the audience want? What does the moderator want? I, well, I, maybe I don't know. I've talked Do you want to much. jump in? Um, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you something. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, we, we know, it, both of you have talked about things that are very contemporary and you know, the, the world is uh, four and a half billion years old, and there's what we call extreme change that can be uh, uh, happen at, over very, very short distances and very short time scales, and there can be 
Uh, this afternoon we heard about extreme events can happen over millions of years, you know, even tens of hundreds of millions of years. So why should we care? I mean, what, what should we as a society think about and worry and, or be prepared for in terms of extreme events? Is, if this is uh, recurring every three to eight years, is it really extreme? Do we, we know it's happening. So what, what, are, what are extreme events that we need to worry about? Uh, how do we prepare for them? Um, I think uh, we have, as a society, we tend to normally uh, prepare for the average. And uh, the point of um, our talks is that it's, it's rarely average. And uh, we don't know uh, if, as the audience has indicated, are these events getting larger or smaller? Uh, are we going to see some event that's uh, bigger? Are we going to see a shift that goes a step function where we're not going to come back? Uh, those are all questions that, mm -hmm. and, and from, from the scientist's perspective, we want to be able to understand these so that we can provide uh, better predictions as to what we think might, might happen. So the, uh, the, you, you, we know that we're changing climate. It's unlikely that the climate change it, changes are going to be as, like an El Nino, but we're going to uh, learn something about those by dealing with them. Uh, there are incredible economic consequences. If you, if, you know, the U.S. invested you know millions of dollars into an observation system along here, so they could predict El Nino, because on the seasonal timescales, you can do lots of things that will uh, uh, save perhaps lives, money. So our ability to predict into the future is incredibly valuable. I mean, if, if, if uh, we know that the anchovy fishery is not going to be around for a decade, uh, it's a, it be, I, I, I guarantee you the fishermen off Peru would like to know that. Mm -hmm. So Mark, do you have a reply? Yeah, a uh, couple of things. Uh, follow up on that point, gosh, 10, 12 years ago, I was having lunch at the little cafe there by the Harbridge Marina, and that's when it was Florida, it was Progress Energy then, I guess it's Duke Energy now. Their offices used to be in the old power plant building there next to the Harbridge Marina, and there were two guys sitting at the next table talking about El Nino. And it turns out one of them was one of the head guys from Progress Energy, and the other guy was a consultant that they had hired to help them predict whether or not there was going to be an El Nino coming, and they were using that information to figure out whether they should buy or sell futures of energy consumption for the following winter, because if it was going to be an El Nino, we're probably going to get more cold weather. They needed to buy future <laughs> shares of energy if it was going to be a non-El Nino, it was going to be a somewhat milder winter, and they would become a seller of energy futures. And, and this was 12 years ago, before we knew nearly as much as we know now. There are commodities traders that use these El Nino predictions to buy corn futures or soybean futures because whether or not there's an El Nino affects crop yields in the Midwest. Um, El Nino tends to suppress hurricanes in the tropical Atlantic. We didn't have very much hurricane activity this past year because it was El Nino year. Next summer, we don't know because this El Nino is not behaving like a lot of past El Ninos might have led us to believe. It's a yeah, <laughs> but on, the, on the, the preparation for storm surge front, I mean, all of you who live in this area probably already have some experience with that and being prepared for the next big storm, even though we haven't had a really bad one here in a while. But Port Authorities, I spent yesterday over at the Port of Tampa with the operations people there talking about their preparations for storms. Even though they haven't had one in a while, they have all sorts of contingency plans in place, largely based on lessons learned from Superstorm Sandy in New York, New Jersey. They have uh, agreements with the fairgrounds to pre-stage equipment there as a storm approaches so that 
as soon as the storm leaves, they can come and start clearing the roads and opening up the port uh, so they can get gasoline flowing again. Like half of all the refined petroleum product for the state of Florida comes under the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. The Port of Tampa shuts down. Gasoline over most of West and Central Florida, gas stations run out of gasoline. Uh, so there are lots of things that you can learn from studying these past storms and trying to understand how things are going to evolve in the future that can you know, save lives, save uh, large sums of money in the future. So Mark and Francisco, so we, we know the, the language of El Nino. When you talk about climate change, at least people uh, understand something is happening, but it has a name. You have a name, an El Nino. So now over the past couple of years, Scientists, distinguished people like you, have been talking about blobs in the ocean. You know, you have a warm blob in the Pacific, or you have a cold blob. In, this is the 21st century, and scientists talking about blobs in the ocean. <laughs> so what, what is this? Is this a new, I, I didn't, a new I didn't language? Coin, I didn't coin that term. <laughs> but it is, it, is, it is, real scientists are using this, these, these terms. So why, why are we, uh, is this something that we just haven't figured out? This is a new, is this an extreme event that we don't know how to name? What's going on here? Um, I think there's a couple of things going on. One is we have never looked at the world in the detail that we're looking at it now. We, we continue to uh, uh, have new ways of, you know, our satellites are better, our observing systems are better, and so uh, we're looking, the, the, one of the reasons is just purely we're looking at it more carefully. Uh, and the second one is we don't know as much as we think we do. Uh, the, uh, the nature tends to not conform to the rules that we think we, th we thought they did. The, the blob essentially, if, if you turn it around, the, the blob in the Pacific, is basically the inverse of this. That's the same area where this warm water formed. And it, it just was unusually long in its state. But the, the location of it is basically part of the variability dis distribution. So it's not that unusual. Mm -hmm. It's just, it was a little, it, over the last 20 or 30 years, we've never seen. Well, in fact, that, if that, you look at the movie that you showed, yeah. it shows up several yeah. times. Yeah. So it was very interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yes? A uh, question on the fact that if El Nino is in place, then we tend not to have as many hurricanes. Is that because of water temperature in the Atlantic or because of the trade winds? Mark, do you want to? Well, Normally, um, during normal years, there's lots of cold water here, and that affects the atmospheric circulation between the Atlantic and the Pacific across South America and leads to very little vertical wind shear. The winds are essentially the same from the surface up through the atmosphere. During El Nino, because of the way this, all this warm water piling up here changes atmospheric circulation patterns, you get a lot of wind shear. The winds at the, near the surface of the ocean are blowing in the opposite direction of the winds in the upper atmosphere. And so when hurricanes start to form, they form by thunderstorms penetrating far up into the, the upper atmosphere and becoming very organized. That wind shear, we call it, lops the tops off of them. And so the hurricanes can never build up the strength that they, they normally do in the absence of that wind shear. So that's how El Nino kills hurricanes, basically. But there is an enhanced hurricane activity in the eastern Pacific yes. and, in, and in the western and Pacific. We saw that this year. We had some of the... And, and you kind of see this a little bit here. This is not quite El Nino, but it tends to be cooler over here. And of course, the hurricanes get generated up here, so there's also a little bit of cooler water yeah. at the site of... of fact, uh, one of the most powerful hurricanes ever recorded was this past year. It hit the coast of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yes? So I'm fortunate to work in the Galapagos, and 82, 83 killed about 95% of the corals. And with the prediction this year, we've been watching, and luckily, even though the water's been warmer, we haven't seen a lot of dead animals. So getting back to what you were both talking about, we're pretty good at predicting the big picture, but we're not so good at predicting more of the local variability, given El Nino or climate change. Where do you think we're headed, and what are the obstacles to improving our forecasts? So the, you know, the, the U.S. and the world actually spent a lot of money in, in, in El Nino forecasting. Um, 
And uh, they actually spend it in a time when there wasn't a lot of El Ninos, which was right around here. <laughs> and so that when there's not a lot of El Ninos, sort of, uh, but, but it, there's more to it than that. This movement of this low uh, is, is, and the atmosphere itself tends to be chaotic. And chaos is a little harder to predict than, uh, depends on, you know, if in your house maybe it's a little easier, but uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, the, uh, the, uh, it, it, there is some serious obstacles because the, because the atmosphere is so, and, 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 the, and what happened this year uh, is shown a little bit in this figure. This figure is actually the lower frequency variability. We've kind of suppressed El Nino and looked at what's left over. But what you see is this, the warmer water is being a little further offshore. And there, there's, uh, what do they call it? They're, they're, the, the, <coughs> the new term is El Nino diversity. <laughs> it's not biodiversity, it's El Nino diversity. At the Ashton Science uh, says there were several, uh, because uh, after 97, 98, we started to get this you know, Central Pacific El Nino, uh, which was, the, the difference for those is that it gets warmer over here, but not along the coasts. And, and it has a completely different set of uh, consequences. And, and the Galapagos, I think, was saved because it was this um, new type of, uh, of an El Nino. And just to finish this, uh, I think this was my last slide anyway. If you suppress the El Nino, then you get these, some of these longer term. And this goes, I think, to, to Frank's point too, is there are other things, and, and I guess it also goes to the definition of extreme. Um, but we tend to be, to go, for California, the demise of the sardine was a pretty uh, uh, extreme event in the 1940s. They uh, started a, a huge observational program called Cal Coffee, that, where they were, they, were, they were going from the tip of Baja all the way to uh, uh, Oregon and Washington, looking for the sardine. Where had it gone? Uh, and and they, there was a lot of debate, and there still is. It, was it because of uh, 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 overfishing, or was, be, was it because this climate changed? And uh, we now know that, that at times, yeah, it's probably both, that you know, when, when the, there are periods of these 40 or 60 years where the, the abundance of sardine uh, a catch in Peru and Japan look exactly like each other, mm -hmm. which means there's something else than just fishing going on. Uh, but anyway, the, these, uh, these events last for about, depending, they're not equal, and they don't always behave themselves, but, but there are these events of longer scale that tend to modulate things. And we think that during these warmer periods, perhaps El Ninos are more active, and they're less active when they're uh, uh, cooler. So I think I'll, 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 I'll... I'd like to ask another, maybe go on another tangent. Uh, you talked about sardines and anchovies. So I, 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 in the ocean, there's life from microbes to whales. Mm -hmm. So if, if you affect life, uh, obviously these events affect life. But what are other events, other extreme events in the life cycle of marine organisms? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, over, you know, uh, this afternoon we heard a talk, uh, Ellen Thomas talked about, you know, whole populations disappearing, just mass extinctions. These are, these are extreme events. So. Mm -hmm. How often does this happen? And what kind of extreme events can we see from microbes to whales and over what time scales? Uh, it's a great question. I don't, I don't think we have, or I have the answer. Um, I think some of the extreme events that uh, I was talking about were of a, a longer duration than our lifetime. Um, but, you know, the, uh, perhaps the low oxygen areas are, are a good example of, of an extreme event as they uh, expand and, and contract. The, and low oxygen is a natural part of the ocean. Right? We, we tend to uh, uh, produce oxygen at the surface and as the material sinks down, it gets consumed. And, and, uh, and in this low, in the deeper waters, uh, you have lower oxygen. In certain areas that don't get replenished from uh, the high latitudes tend to be, keep going lower and lower and lower. And uh, the type of life there is not a, a biological desert. The, the, the people that study the microbes actually 
uh, uh, very much disagree with that. In fact, there's more microbes probably in these low oxygen areas than anything else. Not the things that uh, uh, everyday persons look at or think about. Uh, there's very few, in areas where there's very low oxygen, there's very few fish at the bottom of the ocean. There's mainly mm -hmm. uh, filamentous bacteria. So those are extreme events, right? Yeah, are there other extreme events in the physics of the ocean? Uh, yes. Uh, again, storms and coastal inundation are the ones that, that most affect human populations, but uh, you know, El Nino is a very extreme event from a physical standpoint. In fact, that the global, what we call teleconnections in climate patterns, it changes rainfall and temperature patterns in northern Europe during an, an El Nino year, uh, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, places like that. Um, well, one of the students I'm on a committee for now is looking at something called meteo tsunamis. It's uh, when wind systems move along the coast at just the right speed to generate a big wave at the coastline. We had one last week. It came along the coast of Clearwater to St. Pete and down into Fort Myers, but it happened in the middle of the night and it was only about three feet, four feet, so nobody really noticed it unless they were out you know, <coughs> playing around on the beach in the middle of the night. Um, and so these things happen, but of course, then there's the big tsunamis that we've all heard about and read about uh, are definitely extreme events. We're still looking at the repercussions from the big Japan, uh, what was the name of it, Tohatsu, Tohatsu earthquake of, uh, Fukushima. Tohoku, Tohoku earthquake. Tohoku is the, and that was 2011. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, there are lots of different. Yeah, so there, there, I think what Francisco is trying to show us here is that there's a connection between the physics and the biology that uh, we're still trying to untangle. So, you know, Francisco can tell us here, but you also talked this afternoon about something called like the, the Great White Shark Cafe. And, you know, why does that happen? And can you explain a, what a Great White Shark Cafe is? <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't put any of those. I guess you could consider that an, an extreme event. Uh, uh, if it, we, um, uh, uh, some colleagues of, of mine uh, put tags on great whites. It's actually, tagging a great white is an interesting experience. <laughs> <laughs> you put something that looks like a seal next to the water and it comes after it and then you put a little tag on it and, it, and they, they, uh, the tags actually emit sound and, and we have receivers on, on devices that listen to them. And, and uh, uh, they come uh, and hang around a elephant seal rookery that's just uh, north of Monterey in Año Nuevo. Uh, we think they're mainly after the uh, sea lions there. But anyway, they hang around there for, uh, uh, from about August to February. And then around March, there's a still, we got another hit just recently, so one, there's a straggler that's still hanging around. Then they, they, they go down here south of Hawaii and they congregate. And we don't really understand very well why they're doing that. Uh, we think it's some kind of re reproductive behavior. Uh, the, uh, 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 the males uh, uh, bounce dive. They, they go from the surface to 500 meters just up and down repeatedly until they, f until they sense something and then they stop at that level. And uh, uh, we've been trying to develop uh, some uh, camera that goes on the, uh, with the tag that will turn on when they get there so we can see what they're doing. Uh, uh, we, we think they're looking for their mates uh, and that there's some uh, olfactory thing that they're, they're queuing on as they do this. But they, we do this repeatedly. We don't know why, but they're, they go to this cafe and then after they have their coffee and whatever else, they come, they, they come home to California. Why would organizations like the World Health Organization, uh, the Center for Disease Control, and so forth, be interested in, 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 in El Nino Southern Oscillation events? Um, we know that, in, that uh, there's increases in things like cholera 
uh, of Peru. So there, uh, warmer waters are going to likely, you know, the, the in the last uh, national climate assessment, there was a, I co-authored one of the chapters, and there was a big piece on on, on that because warmer waters are going to uh, uh, harbor more and faster growth of uh, pathogens. So there, there's significant interest in that uh, in that realm. That's a pretty straightforward. Uh, um, relationship, and they, does that answer that simply, or do you uh, want me to? Like, yeah, rainfall and dengue fever and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah so that, it, it, yeah. it rains more yeah. in places where yeah. it never rains, and you get blooms of mosquitoes mm -hmm. in places yeah. where you normally don't, yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. Take my head uh, okay. Something about that, that depending where you think in the, in the air you live, there are some places that are more heat for that, with a niño. And for example, here in the United States, we have more rain. But in the southern Caribbean, we have much less rain. And I'm, I'm coming from Venezuela, and Venezuela has had two years of drought, and it's, it has been such a uphill, I think. The big tanks uh, that produce electricity and hot water, they are at the historical minimum. And it's a big, big deal in a whole country. So that depends, I guess, what part of the world you live and what is happening. And I was just remembering, like uh, a long time ago, I read a uh, paper about the, how the Maya civilization ceased to exist. And they were blaming like several years of drought that uh, in that area there are not really rivers, but uh, underground water. And some events like that it could cause several years of drought that could end a whole civilization. There was a, uh, there's a legend in, in, from Peru where uh, uh, the leader of a pre-Inca civilization moved his town during an El Nino year and it rained and it caused all this famine and the legend goes that he was sacrificed after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't have a good sacrifice question. <laughs> <laughs> but Mark, in, in your work with the ports and thinking about climate change, they're obviously thinking that hurricanes might get more intense. Are they talking all about potential changes in tracks due to atmospheric and ocean changes? Not so much at the, the port engineering level. Um, they're more interested in preparing for the worst case scenario under whatever the latest estimates of what those worst case scenarios might be. And even though the, the average tracks might change, again, uh, the mean is meaningless when you're starting to talk about the extremes because it's the extremes that do the damage or cause the major shifts in populations and things like that. It's not the mean conditions we were about. It's, you know, if it's normally distributed, it's that stuff out in the 2% tails of that distribution that, that are of, of most concern. Hello. I'd like to uh, make a remark, Frank, uh, lastly, about whatever you were saying, that if you're talking about the long-term geological history, which I'm working with, then many people say something along the lines of, you know, it's always been warm, it's always been cold, you know, why would we worry about that? And so the answer to that, I, I always feel strongly about that, and I think that it's uh, not a very smart question, uh, because uh, <laughs> the world has indeed always been warm and always been cold. And some of the periods that I study had no ice caps on the Antarctic. And the world doesn't care at all. The world functions great when it's warm. It's just our civilization that happens to be in the way. And so it's not anything that you know, the world is going down the drain. It's our civilization. And you know, as someone who is from Holland who is just as uh, you know, having problems with sea level rise as Florida has, uh, <laughs> You know, if you have no ice cap on Antarctica, a sea level is uh, 60 to 70 meters, 200 feet higher. And so there will be no Florida. And so the world has no problems. But it's the human civilization that has problems. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, uh, why would we care about ocean physics if we weren't thinking about it, right? So, yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead. One thing on the El Nino effect on the fishing industry and, and world fishing, I mean, does it, does it go down? I mean, are we affected tremendously by maybe the migratory issues that it causes and the fishermen can't find what they're, because they're, they go to deeper depths and we suffer from a great loss during this time or is it just normal? Um, there's a lot of redistribution and it's hard to tell. So somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. That's, I think that's the story of changes in climate. There's winners and losers. 
um, you know, the, the anchovy uh, population gets hammered, but you, you know, there's a new resource in the shrimp that are, is a, a more profitable. Uh, um, I, but I think, I, I think it, it's, in general, there's probably a negative effect because it's a, it's a little bit harder to react in time, but we're getting better at that. The, uh, um, the um, agriculturally, there's, there are some huge changes, and those are a little harder to deal with. There was a, a recent meeting in, in Rome put on by the UN about you know, responding to this El Nino uh, changes in, in agriculture and food security. So the big, big changes there. When I was a graduate student, you know, uh, uh, the story that I was put out of business by the Tau Array because the Tau Array you know, now gives you know, real-time information. It's a wonderful resource. You can pick it up. Any, anybody can. And the fishermen all, you know, and the people. I used to get yeah, calls. Maybe you, we only have a couple minutes, but maybe you can say what the Tau Array is. Okay, the, let, me let me finish the story. I used to get calls from soybean farmers in Argentina because I had access to the temperatures off Peru. They call me on the phone. Uh, we, don't, we don't do that anymore. We use the internet or, or Facebook or something like that. They called me on the phone and asked me you know, what was going on because there's, there's a huge uh, 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 change in, in uh, rainfall in this part of the world, and that it, it, it was twofold. If the, if, the, if the anchovies went down, that w which uh, produces fish meal, then the value of the soybean went up. Uh, and, and they also knew how to, how to deal with it. The Tower Ray. It is a series of, of uh, moorings that go from uh, just west of the, or east of the Galapagos all the way across the Pacific, and they report information in real time. And so you, you can basically you can pull up, like the one that yeah, I showed earlier. You can pull up that information now, and they have these beautiful graphs of you know what, what's going on today. Uh, and so I was put out of business by the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so any closing comments? I, I wanted to follow up, I think, with what Ellen said, and uh, the uh, esteemed climatologist Newt Gingrich uh, <laughs> uh, was in a talk, talk yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was in a uh, talk show, and he, and the and the uh, 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 the talk show person was giving a hard time. Well, you know, do you don't believe in climate change? And so he said, asked them, well, what is the optimum temperature of the world? <laughs> And so I'll leave you with that. <laughs> <laughs>